Thank you for listening. This is the Combatus Academy podcast number two. My name is Rafi Gabriel, founder of Combatus Academy. For more of our podcasts, please check out our website, combatusacademy.com. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about the origins of martial arts. I'm going to talk about what martial arts is as a definition and also how to best determine what a good system is. But before I get into those other subjects, and then I'm going to go deep, so um, I'm not always going to make every podcast uh, scholarly, but this one will have uh, some of that scholarly knowledge uh, that you can pick up on. First thing I'd like to discuss is uh, what I call the martial art renaissance. Martial art renaissance is a a global cultural shift that we have seen over the last, I'd say, 20 years and, and going very strong in the last 10 years. Probably it has something to do with Hollywood, with all the martial art movies and um, martial art inspired um, fighting scenes in, in, in many genres of action films. It probably has a lot to do with the UFC. The UFC has had a, a huge influence in in martial arts overall, the interest in, uh, or, or a new interest, I'd say, in getting back into training, getting back into learning self-defense, and getting back into uh, learning an art that, um, you know, delivers on its promise. And I think uh, BJJ, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, is one of those arts that really does deliver on its promise that you would see in the UFC, the early days of the UFC, the way it showed a smaller person defeating larger and stronger uh, fighters. The martial arts and combatives uh, in general, I think, have also taken uh, a more prominent role in our society uh, because uh, there is a uncertainty when it comes to uh, what, the, what the news is saying from day, to, day in and day out. The uncertainty probably makes people think that it's not a bad idea to train. And, of course, we're, you know, concerned with fitness and health, and uh, martial arts is always uh, a great way to make sure that you're staying active and, uh, and, and kind of like delivering on your own promise, maybe that you made in prior years, uh, that you're going to stay fit, that you're going to make sure to exercise. And uh, martial arts training is one of the best ways to... Um, to uphold those New Year resolutions, whether it's this coming year or it was in, in past years, because when you train in martial arts, it's usually not as boring as just going to the gym. I would say the epicenter of this renaissance is probably Southern California, and uh, maybe the core of that epicenter is is Los Angeles. Los Angeles has some of the most incredible uh, martial arts schools in the world. Certainly, if you are interested in grappling, that is probably, I'd say, uh, LA is one of the is probably the, the best place to be. Um, you have the Machados, you have the Gracies, you have uh, Gokor uh, with High Stun Dojo in North Hollywood. You have Inosano in Orange County. You have Eric Paulson. So some of the biggest names in grappling is in Southern California. A lot of them are in Los Angeles and and surrounding areas. So I think this is a, um, a trend that's not going to go away, at least no time soon. I think martial arts, this renaissance that we're seeing is kind of a, a ensuring that, at, that it is a part of our culture just as much as other sports, maybe like baseball to America is. It has now become synonymous with um, most cultures of the world. And I think everybody's pretty much acquired uh, that taste and uh, and that desire for uh, these arts. So I think this is a good thing, and uh, you know we can see that there's um, more and more guys that are um, using this for fitness. They're using uh, martial arts uh, to make new friends. I would say that's most of my. The buddies that I came up with are still good friends of mine, and we still train together uh, from time to time. So that friendship and camaraderie, you know, you, I don't think you could replace it with anything else. There's just something a little, spe- a little extra special to it. 
the guys that you train with versus guys that you just um, play sports with. And then there's um, there's the appreciation for cultures that you learn by by studying various martial arts. So let's answer the question then, what is martial arts? And this is a, a question that a lot of people probably think they have an answer to, but I would say that most of the time it is an inaccurate um, definition. If you ask the average person what is martial arts, they're going to say it is some sort of Asian fighting form. And while there's some truth to that, it is not uh, a sufficient definition of what martial arts is. It is a very narrow definition, and so we want to be much more clear about what we mean by the words martial and by the word art. So martial uh, it means anything relating to fighting or war. And art, in this case, means anything, um, means a skill acquired through practice. So any skill uh, acquired through practice. So together, a martial art is a fighting skill acquired through practice. Or it's a uh, war skilled acquired through practice. It does not say anywhere there that it, it requires it to be an Asian fighting form. So this is a much broader um, uh, definition and a much more accurate one. Later on, when I uh, define other terms like Budo and Wushu, those terms will be a little bit more probably what people expect it to be. Like Budo, for example, is much more synonymous with the way the Japanese see martial arts, and that, that would require another podcast. So then, could we have other examples of, uh, of martial arts that are maybe outside of the scope of the common understanding of an Asian fighting form? Well, yeah, one thing we could bring up is uh, firearms. Um, anytime you study firearms for the purpose of fighting, it's a martial art. So examples might be um, if you go to a sniper school or if you're just a rifleman or if you learn uh, CQB, which is close quarter battle, clearing rooms with your team. Uh, these are all highly skilled jobs that you would have uh, with firearms. These are you know, what soldiers do nowadays in modern times. Because we're talking about weapons, we're talking about the the um, use of weapons in in through for fighting or for war, and we uh, are talking about using these weapons uh, in a highly skilled way, you know that's acquired through practice. So it very much uh, is an example of a martial art. So what about other examples? Maybe if you um, Take it one step further. What if it doesn't directly have something to do with a with with uh, being a man of arms, for example, not having a weapon on your own? A good example of a martial art that might have nothing to do with weapons directly would be if you were responsible for for signaling. If you were doing signaling for uh, command and control purposes, whether you're in the Roman army or or even in a modern army. Um, that would still be considered a martial art. So, for example, in the Roman times or, 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 or even before and after, they would use musical instruments um, to, to give commands uh, for large-scale uh, battles because uh, it's easier to hear drums, for example, or, um, or, or a type of various types of horns or wind instruments might be used for signaling purposes. It might be used uh, to um, get your army to form up, or to um, to move move forward and attack, or to retreat. So, musical instruments um, for signaling purposes for command and control can also be considered a martial art. I know it sounds a little bit abstract, but it is still. What we're talking about is what is the uh, the purpose of the the uh, skill, and in this case, since it's specifically for for fighting uh, or for warfare, then it is still a martial art. Um, if you were a 17th century sailor, uh, maybe a captain of a ship, uh, you would also be a martial artist because you would understand how to sail. You would understand how to how to handle different kinds of uh, conditions from the ocean, from the water, 
um, how how the wind will affect uh, your ship, how, how configuring your sails uh, would result in uh, moving forward or stopping, or or how it affects your ship in general. Um, you would have to figure out what angle would be the right angle to approach uh, another ship if you wanted to attack it. And you would need to know where your gun placements had to be. So all those details would have to be filled in. And you would uh, then um, use those skills to fight on the water. And that would still be a martial art. Even though, again, you're talking about a... Um, it's not directly involving you kicking and punching in the air or, or, or doing what you would normally think of as a um, Asian fighting form. These are still considered martial arts. So then where did all martial arts come from? And I mean, if we really go back far enough in time to really uh, uh, ascertain the, the beginnings of all uh, fighting behavior that human beings have, the most uh, logical place to go would be to look at our uh, hunting experiences in as early man. Early man, who is the ancestors of all human beings on Earth now, uh, all had hunting experiences uh, for for many many centuries. We were all we were we had to be hunters because that's that's how you would eat. Um, everybody at some point has an ancestor that hunted. He just had to do it. So th those skills in hunting uh, changed our ability to fight. Uh, it, it gave us the core um, understanding of what it means to fight. And, uh, and hunting skills have a close correlation to fighting skills. So I'll get more into it in a second. I just want to uh, point out a story of a man named Nimrod. And you might have heard of Nimrod. He is uh, he's a character from the Bible and, uh, and some uh, history books. Nimrod was one of the greatest kings of all time and, one, and, and known as the greatest hunter in the world at that time. This is the ancient world. He was considered uh, both a great hunter and a great warrior. Uh, he was such a great warrior that he established the kingdom of Ab of Babylon, and uh, and stretched out his his uh, kingdom from Babylon to Nineveh, Assyria, and beyond. So we have an example from from uh, very old writings, from ancient writings, of a man that was both considered a great hunter and a great warrior. This is probably around the time when when um, the uh, the arts of war were learned, and uh, and that's when maybe Nimrod learned them and started to apply them so that he could be one of the first kings uh, in, of history and uh, used his martial skill and martial knowledge, uh, undoubtedly partly uh, acquired through being a great hunter, and apply those lessons uh, to his conquests. Nimrod was considered a hero and maybe also, more accurately, a tyrant. But uh, he was a, a known as a man of renown and, and was um, you know, one of the first to ever create an empire. So there's a, um, a, a very interesting correlation now between somebody that was a hunter, known to be the greatest hunter in the world, and also a warrior. I'm going to explain a little bit more completely what I mean now by uh, the similarities or correlations between fighting and hunting because uh, it's, it, it requires some examination to be clear about it. Hunting has in it um, certain skills that you must have. You have to keep cool uh, under pressure. Okay, You have to know when to take initiative and then when it's the right time you just have to go. There is a, an aspect to hunting called approach, close, enter, or approach, close, kill, which is um, sort of like the seminal skill set for all martial knowledge. All martial arts skills should have this in them somewhere, this approaching, closing, entering, or killing. And uh, 
the the way that your uh, psychology works in that situation is has a lot to do with the um, the evolution of early man into becoming hunters, um, predatory animals. There is a um, a story that my jujitsu teacher told me. And uh, he, you know, this is kind of a side side note, but I think it's it's useful, and it will kind of come back around to explain uh, the more scientific understanding of how hunting and and fighting are related. He would tell me that there is a world of claws and a world of teeth, and what he meant by that is that the world of claws is somebody that is not serious about hurting you, but uh, wants to uh, intimidate you in hopes that you're gonna back away and then there's a world of teeth the world of teeth is the opposite of the world of claws they don't hope to intimidate you they are intending to finish you so the claws uh, i guess if you have an analogy of a cat the claws are used to um to intimidate you to fight you to scratch to hurt you but mainly just to get you to go away the world of teeth is so they bite you on the back of the neck and uh, that's that's the kill shot right there. Okay, so that's, those are the main two differences. Now, the way to more scientifically explain that is what's called effective aggression versus predatory aggression. Effective aggression, um, effective just means emotional or highly emotional. And predatory aggression, uh, I guess that's sort of self-explanatory. Effective aggression uh, involves an intense emotional change in the person's nervous system, they might be uh, there might be a, a big um, a big jump in their hormonal levels, uh, such as adrenaline, so that they are now uh, very upset, very adrenalized. Um, they might be going through a fight or flight um, uh, change within them, so they're figuring out what to do. Um, they might take defensive postures in effective aggression and they might change as they're uh, talking to you, probably threatening you. They might change their readiness status from being ready to not being ready and then back to being ready again. And then if they should attack with the effective aggression side, the attacks are not designed to finish somebody. They're really designed to um, agitate and to intimidate and to get you to leave. So if we contrast that with a predatory aggression, it's completely different. The predatory side does not have that emotional change. The the uh, uh, nervous system does not get flooded with um, adrenaline. Um, and maybe you get a small change in their heart rate but not much going on there as far as their physiology. Um, the predatory side does not take defensive postures. Instead, they go into a stalking posture or stalking mode. They might just be standing there talking to you, but internally they're not thinking, um, you know, I'm going to be defensive. They're ready to hit you and knock you out, right? And that's the, uh, that's the end game for the predatory behavior is to knock someone out and down. Um, there won't be any changes in their readiness status and in the predatory behavior. And when they do finally attack, it is for the finish. It is to knock them out. Um, so you, you could see this kind of effective aggression versus predatory aggression uh, manifest itself uh, in fights. Maybe you saw them in high school or in your day-to-day -day life for some reason. Hopefully you didn't see too many of them in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, but if you go on YouTube, there are tons of videos now of, uh, of people getting into it. And you will see that usually there's this one guy that's mouthing off. Um, and that's the effective aggression side. And the other guy that's pretty quiet, and that's the predatory aggression side. And you will see the difference between those two. And how the predatory aggression side will usually go for the one big hit to finish him. Now, it doesn't always end with the predatory side winning, but it usually does. Uh, it just kind of depends on a lot of variables. But usually you see the predatory side knocking out the guy that's being loud. So those types of behaviors 
are uh, a part of our wiring as human beings and come from our evolution as hunters. So that experience, those presumably thousands of years of, of hunting, uh, is, it seems to be in our DNA and seems to be hardwired in most people. So it's there. So those attributes uh, of uh, approaching, closing, and, and, and killing or approach, close, and enter, and that decisiveness and taking initiative and not having a lot of uh, emotional response but going straight for the finish is an essential part of what makes up a martial art. So let's take talk about what is a martial art in, in terms of... Uh, training in a practical sense all martial arts could be summed up by the term pattern practice all of our training is uh it can be summed up with pattern practice so what is pattern practice well in the japanese call it a kata the indonesians call it a juru there are many many names um from different arts and the different uh martial arts systems have created uh, their own patterns that you would train, you would practice over and over again, thousands of times, so that it becomes a part of who you are, it becomes a part of your nervous system, and it allows you to respond correctly to uh, to an attack. Now, of course, different martial arts uh, systems have different answers for what is correct and what is not correct. But if you're learning a, a, a real art, then um, it should be a full system so that it covers every possibility. So these patterns uh, had to come from somewhere. So where did they come from? All martial art patterns, all real martial art patterns, came from real-world fighting experience. Again, the uh, real-world fighting experience must have originally come from this... Um, this uh, hunting experience that we had uh, in, in our uh, evolution. That hunting experience in our evolution that's hardwired in us allows us to, to behave a certain way that makes us effective in combat. Okay, Some people are more effective than others, though. And the winning side of any fight or combat is the one that's going to be able to create... Um, their system, their formalized system of fighting. So they're going to say, well, look, this is what worked for me. I did this, and, and, and he did that, and then, and then I did this, and it was over. Uh, if you take those lessons that you learn from practical experience, from essentially winning fights, then that will be how you create a martial art. You create it by taking real-world experience and enhancing it through your creativity and, and development. So martial arts is partly invented and partly discovered, but I would say the core of it is discovery through experience. And then the inventiveness part is taking the, the aspects of a successful fight and uh, taking those lessons and creating patterns out of them through your creativity and development. So that's what a martial art is. If a system does not come from a uh, real world experience, then that's when you need to question whether this art is something you should be studying or not. All real martial art systems have that one thing in common. They all came from real fighting experience. So then what is uh, the most important thing to consider the most important thing to consider when it comes to figuring out where to train is to, to know that the experiences um, are from the real world that developed your system and not something that was invented. So that's very important. Now, this idea that systems are discovered is not, is not entirely new. It's just I think sometimes people uh, forget that it is a requirement of any discipline and any, any type of knowledge, let's say, uh, must have come from somewhere. And human beings can do one of two things. They could either discover knowledge or they can um, 
create it. Um, they, you just want to make sure that when it comes to something as practical as fighting, that it came from real world experience. So if you are um, looking at different martial arts systems, how do you know whether the system that you're uh, considering is, um, is discovered, that the knowledge is discovered from real world fighting experience or not? Well, older systems uh, have advantages and newer systems have advantages. Um, it depends on what you're looking for. The advantage to the older system is that if, if there's a system that's been around long enough, the uh, system has had more time to mature. So more brains and more people have worked on it. Now consider uh, a martial art like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, how different it was when it was first introduced to the United States versus how far it's developed since then. One of the reasons is that there's a lot of people working on it, there's a lot of brain power and a lot of people with different body types, um, different ideas, different ways, different uh, points of view of what is uh, possible. And they have all, you know, sort of um, uh, it contributed to, to the grappling arts. There are people that borrowed ideas from other grappling arts. They have cross-trained. So, you know, it's a very alive kind of art right now is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I would say that in many ways, a martial art has similar attributes to a language. Languages can be um, alive or dead. They can be extinct. Uh, sometimes there's no I, no uh, knowledge of what an extinct language was like. Uh, they have evidence of it, but they don't know. It could be a dead language where there's um, nobody speaks it anymore. But uh, they kind of know what it was about, and it you know it was not dead for that long, so it's not extinct. And then there are languages that are alive, and then there's languages like English where it's um, it's being used by, by by the whole world almost, you know. And so the more people that that are involved in an activity, the the higher uh, level of of um, development you're going to get. Now, English has a lot of borrowed words, for example, but it's still English, and it it, it might borrow ideas and words from other 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 uh, languages, but it's still the in, within the context of developing English. And same with let's say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they might borrow ideas from other martial arts, but it's still uh, it is a, a it is the growth of the art. So, if you want to study a traditional art it's probably a good idea to make sure that the uh, the patterns have some sort of um, real world and uh, uh, very clear usage and use it like uh, application. One of the things that happens with traditional arts is that the, the knowledge gets lost from uh, teacher to student, teacher to student. So that is the one penalty. The benefit of a traditional art is that it's been around a long time and a lot of people have contributed to it by dint of it being around a long time. Uh, modern systems, there's a good and bad to that too. The penalty is that it hasn't been around a long time, but a modern system uh, might have some of the benefits of of uh, comparing uh, from uh, and contrasting what they did in the old days they might build on um, an older system, but improve it. Um, you just have to be careful of martial arts systems that are completely invented. They have no uh, record or proof of it being effective and that uh, maybe nobody's studying it. Um, if, if absolutely nobody's training in a system and you don't see any evidence of it being um, effective, and you, you, know, you got to pressure test every system that you're, uh, that you're interested in training in, if he, if he, if it fails the pressure testing, um, then it's probably not worth your time. So those are some of the things to consider when deciding uh, what type of uh, martial arts systems you should practice. What I think is most important for for the sake of combatives um, is that you have a well-roundedness. That's important. You should be able to strike very well, strike very hard. You should be able to. Um, uh, at least be uh, uh, able to get out of bad positions 
and uh, you should be able to take people down and uh, and and apply um, uh, submissions. You should be able to apply a submission even standing and doesn't really require you to be on the ground. And of course, you should have a, a weapons based uh, knife based training as at your core because that covers everything else. Um, those are some of the, the critical ideas that are uh, uh, valuable to, to consider. So uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, a terminology that I think is important called emic and etic. Emic versus etic. Emic, E M I C, and etic, E T I C. Emic means that you are within the culture, that you grew up in the culture, and etic means you are outside the culture or you're observing from the outside of the culture. These are useful terms for, for martial arts. These terms came um, from anthropology. But what's good about it is that it, it will help you decide whether you have an understanding that is uh, emic or etic about a martial arts system. So, for example, if you've never studied a, a style, you, are, uh, have, you have an etic uh, understanding of it. And that means you really don't know. So if you don't know... You got to look into it before you make a determination whether a system is good or not. If you have done the system, and I mean really done it, like you've done it for a while, like maybe at least a year, you have some idea of of what a system is really like. Now there's uh, more to it when deciding what a martial arts, uh, let's say a school that you want to go to, um, what what it should be about and what it should be like and what your expectations, uh, whether they can be met or not. Um, when you go train at any any particular school, what's going to happen is that um, you can get the system from that from that teacher, and that teacher is going to teach you what he knows, and he, you know you should know who his teacher is. So you need to know who your teacher is going to be, and who your teacher's teacher is. That will give you your lineage. And uh, without knowing your lineage, um, you know, you're, you're, you can never be too sure of where your system came from. So you have to know the lineage, and uh, that will give you a much more um, a clear understanding of what you're training in. I bring up emic and etic because um, there is really no um, clearinghouse for martial arts. So what I mean by that is that you could go to a martial arts school like an Aikido school and um, you could get maybe five different versions of Aikido if you visit five different schools. I mean there's a lot of uh, sub styles of martial arts systems so you have um, people that will create a sort of a a variation to a system but uh, many styles of martial arts, even if they claim they teach Aikido, they teach Wing Chun, they teach Muay Thai, they teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you need to know um, it, what that particular school offers because that is the real emic version of that art that they, they, they teach you. You will know their lineage. You'll know exactly what their emphasis is. And because you, there's no way for you to tell if someone says to you, well, they, you know, that's, a, that's an Aikido school. Well, how do you know what they really emphasize? Because you can't just look at Aikido and go, well, that's what they teach. you got to see what they specifically teach, what they specifically emphasize, and uh, what their philosophy is, and uh, what their um, focus is. So in some cases, maybe they're not that concerned with combatives. They're not that concerned with... Uh, self-defense maybe they're more concerned about other things so you should look into it and ask a lot of questions I also recommend checking out a school at least twice before making a determination good or bad if you go once for one night or for one class you're not a hundred percent sure if that's what you see is what you get sometimes schools could have a, an off night or sometimes schools can have a, a particularly good night it's a good idea to maybe, if you're really serious about a place, check it out at least twice. And uh, most places will give you uh, two trial classes. That's not uncommon. Or you could at least ask for a second trial if they only give one. So those are my suggestions for figuring out how to find a good martial arts school. Uh, the term emic and etic are useful so that you will recognize when you are on the inside or the outside. If you are on the outside, if you have an etic point of view, uh, don't take... 
other people's word for it. Don't take your buddy's word for what a martial arts system is, if it's good or if it's bad. You got to go check it out and research it yourself because it might be bad for him and good for you. Or it might be that he got it wrong. So uh, it's a good idea to do your own research. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover in podcast number two. Thank you very much for listening. This is Rafi Gabriel for Commandos Academy podcast number two, signing out.